Among many of the effects of the new wave of Anglo-American settlements in the West was a transformation of the region's economy. The new American settlers tied the West firmly to a growing industrial economy of the East. Mining, logging, ranching, commercial farming, and many other economic activities relied on the East for their markets and for their capital. Some of the most powerful economic institutions in the West were great uh, Eastern corporations that controlled the mines and the ranches and the farms. One of the first economic boons in the West occurred in the area of mining. Starting in 1849 with the California Gold Rush, thousands of settlers moved into the mineral-rich mountains where they hoped to make quick fortunes. However, the life of the individual prospector was relatively brief. Uh, there would be news of a, a gold or silver strike in an area, and this would start a huge stampede of settlers, causing towns to literally grow up overnight. Individual prospectors would move in, and they would claim their area, and they would exploit the first shallow deposits by hand with their picks and their shovels and their pans. But after these surface deposits dwindled, this is when the corporations moved in. Mining was an expensive operation that required lots of capital and technological resources in order to exploit the claims. The first great mineral strikes other than the, gold, the California Gold Rush occurred just before the Civil War. Uh, the most valuable vein of silver known as the Comstock Lode was discovered in Nevada in 1859. Now, although gold and silver discoveries uh, pretty much generated the most popular excitement, in the long run, it was other natural resources that proved to be more important in the area of mining. Um, resources like copper and lead and tin, quartz, zinc, all, these proved to be, all of these proved to be more profitable in the long run. The thousands of people who flocked into the mining towns in search of quick wealth and who failed at it uh, often uh, remained as wage laborers in the corporate mines after the boom period. Working conditions in these mines were generally terrible, with workers facing uh, excessive heat and very poor ventilation. There were frequent explosions, cave-ins and fires, as well as accidents with heavy machinery. Mining as a result became one of the most dangerous and demanding working environments in the United States. Another important element of the changing economy in the West was cattle ranching. The open range, that is the, the, vast grass, the vast grasslands of the public domain, provided a huge area on the Great Plains area where cattlemen could graze their herds free of charge and unrestricted by the boundaries of private farms. The Western cattle industry had its roots with Mexico. Long before citizens of the United States came to the Southwest, Mexican ranchers had developed techniques and equipment that cattlemen and cowboys of the Great Plains would later adopt. Things like uh, branding, uh, roundups, and roping. They also used gear such as lariats, uh, saddles, leather chaps, and spurs. Now, Texas also had the largest herds of cattle in the country. They were called Texas Longhorns. And these animals were descended from imported Spanish stock and had been allowed to run wild throughout the frontier. Also from Texas came the small muscular horses called Mustangs or Broncos that were very well suited to the requirements of ranching. At the end of the Civil War, nearly five million cattle roamed the Texas Range. Some ranchers began driving the herds north to the railroad lines in Missouri. Markets began to grow up all along the rail lines. And between 1867 and 1871, it's estimated that nearly 1.5 million head of cattle were driven up the uh, very famous Chisholm Trail to Abilene, Kansas. Cattlemen developed many trails and other markets opened further west. However, farmers from the east began building fences around their land claims and they blocked off some of the trails and it broke up uh, a lot of the open range. As a result, a series of range wars between farmers and ranchers erupted, erupted as a result. The profits in the cattle business tempted many eastern businessmen as well as uh, Europeans to invest in this highly lucrative industry. However, it faced a setback because there were two severe winters um, that occurred between 1885 and 1887. And in between those two winters was, was a searing summer that scorched the plains. And this caused a shortage of grassland. So as a result of this, this bad weather, 
Hundreds of, of thousands of cattle died when the streams and the grass began to dry up. And the open range industry never really recovered, um, and as a result, the long drive disappeared forever. Railroads began to dis displace the trail as the route to market for livestock. So the established ranches with fenced in grazing land and, and stocks of hay for the winter survived, and they grew and they prospered. The first great wave of new settlers to the west after the Civil War was made much easier with the railroad. In particular, completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, as we just mentioned, in 1869, and then the construction of many subsidiary lines encouraged settlement. Additionally, the lure of land encouraged settlement. Um, in 1862, Congress passed something called the Homestead Act, and this permitted settlers to buy plots of 160 acres of land for a relatively small fee. Uh, the only catch was they had to occupy it for five years and to make improvements on the land, and then the land was theirs. So it was a, it was a great lure for people in the East to come West and with the promise of this, this um, um, attainable land. Yet under the most favorable conditions though, farming on the plains presented uh, some very special problems. Uh, farmers were faced with things like blizzards and tornadoes and grasshoppers, uh, hailstorms, drought, prairie fires and disease, and this is just a few of the catastrophes that could befall even the best farmer uh, in the, in the, on the Great Plains. Um, and, and while the Homestead Act provided access to cheap land, the homesteaders still needed money for a house, a team of farm animals, uh, a well for water access, they needed money for fencing, and money to plant their seed for their crops. Now on the Great Plains, because wood was so scarce, families built homes of, uh, made of prairie sod. Uh, it was called sod houses, and they used uh, dried manure for heating and cooking. Now for women on the frontier, simple daily tasks like obtaining water and fuel meant uh, backbreaking labor. They may have to walk some ways to, to be able to gather uh, the water that they needed uh, to complete their chores. And life on the plains also was one of loneliness and monotony, uh, particularly since land was dispersed in 160 acre plots. This meant that your, your closest neighbor was still at least a mile and a half away. So it took some inner resolve to be able to, to live on the Great Plains. Now, during the 1880s with uh, land values rising, new, uh, new farmers to the Midwest had no problem of obtaining any kind of extensive or easy credit. But in the last part of the decade, farmers faced drought coupled with falling crop prices. As a result, tens of thousands of farmers could not pay their debts, uh, they couldn't pay their mortgages, and they were uh, forced to abandon their farms. By the late 19th century, the sturdy, independent farmer of popular myth was being replaced by the commercial farmer. Commercial farmers were not self-sufficient, and they made no effort to become so. Instead, they specialized in cash, uh, cash crops, which they sold in national and world markets. They didn't make their own uh, household supplies, nor did they grow their own food, but they bought it instead at the, the, the local town stores. This kind of farming, when it was successful, raised the farmers' living standards, but it also made them dependent on bankers and interest rates, railroads and freight rates, national and world markets, including um, supply and demand. And unlike the capitalist of the uh, industrial order, commercial farmers couldn't regulate their, pr uh, their production, nor could they influence the prices of what they sold. American commercial farmers were constantly open, opening uh, new lands, and they were producing much more than the domestic market could absorb. So they were forced to rely on the world market to absorb some of the surplus. But because the, the international market was so unpredictable, uh, it put them at great risk. And we're gonna see this um, much more in a future lecture. Now, let's take a closer look at the Native American tribes living in the West and this, the impact of Anglo-American migration on these tribes. <laughs> 